This is the season of creation and today the focus is the ocean. My place of origin is often referred to as the people of Oceania or the Moana. Why are we called this name? Well, thousands of years ago, our ancestors set sail across the world into the deep blue seas of the South Pacific. The fluidity and the powerful forces of the ocean is where our ancestors came to their first encounter with Moana. I've often wondered what those encounters looked like. They came face to face with the powerful forces of the deep sea and some of them lost their lives while others survived and reached the final desti destination where they finally call home. The journey of our ancestors through the South Seas symbolizes bravery and an encounter with nature which created a bonding between humanity and nature. That bonding is a relationship we call the Tauhiva, or in other words, reciprocity. The concept of Tauhiva is how one describes their relationship to their family. As you can see, we do not treat the land, animals and the ocean as a separate being, but rather family. Because we believe within the inconnectedness of all, on all God's creation. That interconnectedness looks like all God's creation is connected like family. One must always look out for the other with respect and care. A reciprocal relationship meant the people of Oceania saw the Moana or the ocean not only as a powerful force of nature, but as a life-giving element of nature because their main food supplies derives from the fishes and many other creatures who live in the ocean. There is also the sacredness of the sea because the sharks, whales, turtles and other fishes were gods to our ancestors. So the ocean was not just for the use of human being, but it had its own sacredness because it was perceived as a place that the ancient gods called home. So th therefore, it was a place of worship. So as you can see, we, the people of Oceania, have uphold that a reciprocal relationship between ourselves and the Moana. Moana is a powerful metaphor for, for the interconnectedness of life. Moana, as a dynamic metaphor, is derived and energized from an inherent welling up from within oneself and a yearning to be connected together with others. It emerges from a deep sense of humanity and a place within creation. Despite our exchange relationship and faithfulness to the Moana has positioned us as the frontline victims of rising waters today. And geographically, our context has put us in a vulnerable position some Pacific scholars refer to those of us from Oceania as the canaries of climate change. One of our neighbours, the island of Tuvalu, is slowly sinking. They say within less than 50 years there will be no more Tuvalu. Most of its red residents have migrated to New Zealand and other islands of the South Pacific. The island of Kiribati another frontline canary who no longer has any fresh waters because of the sea waters rising and affecting its waterways. The words I often hear from my brothers and sisters from the South Pacific is, why are we paying for the sins of those big polluters when we have looked after nature and stayed faithful to the reciprocal relationship set by our ancestors? Why are we, the poorest countries, drowning when it's the big empires who created all this, these chaos of nationalism and globalization, etc.? These are only some of the remarks from the people of Tuvalu, Kiribati and others. It echoes a lament of injustice that the most vulnerable and poor people are paying for the sins of the powerful nations. With the rising sea waters and people are losing their homes 
and having to migrate because of the natural destruction. In the same way, we hear Job lamenting about himself to God. There are three parts to his summation. He reminds God about all his blessings, the wealth, honour and happiness. The second is a lament over the loss of everything and the final part is the protest about his innocence. As we reach chapter 38, 1 to 18, 1 to 18 God finally answers to Job. Our reading is taken from the Wisdom Book, chapter 38, 1 to 18. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched a line upon it? On, on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstones? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expense of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Some of us are familiar with the story of Job. Just a little background. Job is blameless and just, God-fearing and turning from evil. He is what they refer to in the Bible as a righteous servant of God who is blessed and God is very much delighted in the person of Job. But when everything started to fall for Job, it made us question what is really going on. This develops one of the central themes of the book, Undeserved Evil. Job loses his wealth, his sons, daughters, and he is afflicted by sores. So he curses the day he was born, but he also questions God on the matter. Many scholars have argued that God's divine speech in chapter 38, he does not answer to Job's nagging. The answers do not address the concern, and that God states that Job's complaining and raging against God are unjustified and proceed from unlimited understanding. God says nothing about Job's suffering, nor does he address God, Job's problem about divine justice. They say this because in our reading, God speaks about creation. I think that God's divine speech does address the issue of undeserved evil, because God is pointing Job to a bigger vision and that his own selfish, human self-centered self. God is listening, but he's saying to look beyond your own life summaries and protest, focusing on your own human condition and needs. Shifa Decker notes that the divine speeches contrary to first impressions do contain 
and answer to the questions and problems of job. The answer has to do in part with the issue of humanity's place in the natural world. God's description of creation reveals to Job that the world does not exist for the sake of humanity, but rather that humanity plays only a part in creation. The world exists for the sake of its creator. To think that we are only part of the order is a big slap in the face to Job, who thought that because he has been such a righteous person who's played by the books, he is supposed to be the most rewarded. It becomes clear that God is reminding Job this whole universe was not created just for you human beings, but you and others of creation are part of my making. For those of us in the South Pacific, we are lamenting the loss of land, belongingness to our islands because of the rising of waters. But we are also resistant to our condition. For us, we somehow see the effects of climate change as a reflection of our coconut theology, which points to the order of God's creation. Javier writes that the full Christology can be seen in the coconut. The incarnation and the virgin birth is in the coconut. For new life to happen, sacrifices must take place. Unfor it's unfortunate for some of us, that the people of the sea have been called to be the canaries of climate change, chosen to be the first people to sink, as well as indicating to others what the order of creation may look like in the future. Climate change is then seen as the guiding force of nature for those of us in Oceania to navigate into the Moana again and reorient the same pilgrimage that our forefathers endeavoured. We know this calls on change in our leadership within the church and our communities. So God's answer to Job also reminds each and every single one of us to look beyond our own human selfishness and worries. We must look to creation and listen to its wisdom. They have orders, but they are not there to serve just the humans. They exist for something beyond ourselves. Amen.